This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider video interview. I have another in my trilogy on free will. Philosopher Kevin Timpey is my guest, and the conversation will begin in a moment. This is the second in my trilogy about free will. Philosopher Kevin Timpey is my guest. Uh, I'd like to give him a few minutes to just give a little background about himself, his ideas about free will, pro or con. And so, Kevin, if you could. Yeah, thanks for having me on here. Um, as you mentioned, I'm a philosopher. I currently teach at Calvin College. Before that, I taught for a number of years at Northwest Nazarene University, and before that, at the University of San Diego. I did my dissertation with Eleanor Stump at St. Louis University, which is where I first got really interested in ideas of freedom. And so much of my work to date has focused in on some of the debates in the uh, contemporary free will literature about incompatibilism and compatibilism, what sorts of control are needed for free will, how does the epistemic condition on moral responsibility relate to freedom, what reasons do we have to think that we might have it, and so on and so forth. Uh, what do you think is the current scientific consensus if any, about free will, because uh, if you Google it online, it seems to be maybe, I would estimate just looking as a layman, probably about two to one people think we have free will, but there's a good healthy minority of people who don't think we have free will. Yeah, I mean, I think that you can find lots of scientific arguments and articles on either side, all the way from uh, science has proved that we never, that we don't and never could have free will to even some recent ones saying that electrons and quarks have free will. Uh, I think before we get to what the scientific evidence says about these things, we first have to figure out what is this thing, free will, that we're talking about so that when scientists go out and look to see what kind of empirical evidence, either for or against it, uh, we know what would count as evidence for the kind of thing uh, that we're talking about. It doesn't seem to me that uh, the existence or non-existence of free will is a purely scientific question. Um, I happen to think that whether or not we have good reason to think that we have free will depends in part upon scientific evidence. Um, but it's not the kind of thing that I think science by itself can, can pronounce. Well, when I do these shows, I send out emails to prospective interviewees. Uh, what force other than your own will would have made you not want to be interviewed uh, on this subject or by me. Uh, this is one of the things I've always found puzzling about people who don't think there's free will. If Kevin Timpey did not want to be interviewed, he would not be here right now. So what possible force could be coercing you somehow to be here against your free will? Well, I do think that uh, wanting to do something under some description of wanting to do it is going to be necessary for free will. Uh, um, and I'll say a bit more about what else I think might be required here in a second. Um, but uh, to, to get at the clarification that I made, wanting to do something under some description, um, I, I happen to think that... Uh, Things in life are good under multiple descriptions. There are multiple ways for something to be good. And I think you can only freely choose to do something if you see it as good in some way or other. Um, my wife and I have three small children. Bedtime with three small children isn't always a particularly fun sort of thing. Um, but I do think that I want to put my children to bed, not because I'm going to enjoy the process of putting them to bed, but because I think it's good that they get proper sleep. I think it's good for me to be able to do some stuff with my wife after they go to sleep. It is good to be able to read. And so I do think that our desires uh, are part of what's necessary for freedom. Though our des desires could be understood either straightforward uh, in terms of wanting to do the action uh, for its own sake, or wanting to do the action in question for the sake of some kind of other good that that would serve. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, okay. okay. Uh, well, you, when you use a term like good, uh, that gets me thinking that a lot of people, and I've seen this quite often, uh, mix up free will with an idea of an ethos that uh, you can't have free will. I mean, that, that somehow free will involves some moral or ethical choice. But that seems to me utterly ridiculous because the vast amount of things we do, whether we turn on a TV or do not, whether we go left or right, whether we sneeze right now or try to hold it in, uh, those things have no ethical component in them. Why do you think free will has gotten 
at least from what I can see, so garbled up with the idea of goodness, morality, ethos. I think that uh, primarily it's because most people think that the kind of control over your actions that freedom would provide if we had it is necessary for moral responsibility. And so if you look in the, in the uh, free will literature, there's lots of, it's, it's pretty standard actually for a lot of folks to just define free will in terms of the control condition on moral responsibility. And so if you think that freedom is going to be necessary for either being morally praiseworthy or morally blameworthy for some particular action or set of actions, you can see how those two ideas would be uh, uh, closely associated. But I think that you're right. I mean, we, we pr presumably freely make lots of choices that aren't going to be specifically moral choices. Um, so when I was getting dressed this morning, I had the choice to, to, to grab the brown plaid shirt or the blue shirt that was right next to it out of my closet. Um, I think that sort of where we buy our clothes might in fact be a moral choice, but picking a particular shirt for a particular color from another shirt right, of, of a different hue or a different shade that you already own isn't particularly morally relevant. Yeah. Um, so it might, that might be an example of a free choice that doesn't have any substantive moral component built into it. Right. Uh, in my first show that I did, the fellow I spoke with, we uh, digressed a little bit about the Libet experiments and uh, associated experiments with that. And uh, other than the uh, ethos or morality, another thing that uh, I found that, that seems to get mixed up in the ideas of free will is that there seems to be in free people who deny free will, the, the idea that somehow life is binary. You can either go left, right, zero, one, black, white, good, bad, but instead of get, when you get to the fork in that road, as in a Robert Frost poem, there just aren't two paths. Oftentimes there might be 38 or 51 or 11 or 163. And it seems to me so complex that if we have just a concatenation of 10 minutes worth of choices we can make, we would be literally near infinite. I mean, it, it, it seems to me, even even if we're just talking about binary choice, it would be staggeringly huge. Um, do you think that the people who deny free will are, are overly simplifying things? Uh, I think sometimes. I mean, I think that the philosopher Al Mealy at Florida State has probably done the best job to show some of the problems. He was, he was the first guy I just interviewed. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, his work is fantastic, and he's a great guy. Uh, he's he's probably the I think the the best person to sort of call into question some of the assumptions that are made in the Libet experiments, or at least made in the way that the Libet experiment evidence is used to suggest that we don't have free will. Mm. Um, I do think that yeah. The, the, uh, the plethora of choices we have in particular cases is going to be astronomical. Um, before coming to my office this afternoon, I was uh, grocery shopping. And one of the things on my grocery list was cereal. Um, right? And so it's not I buy cereal or I don't buy cereal. It's I buy one of 426 different flavors of cereal. For each of them, I could buy the name brand. I could buy the store brand. I could buy... Right, the 12 ounce box, yeah. the 16 ounce box, the 42 ounce box. Um, there's actually one of my favorite books to, to, to teach and to sort of talk about is um, Barry Schwartz's The Paradox of Choice. I don't know if yeah. you're familiar with it at all. I, I've heard Schwartz of it. Schwartz yes. is a psychologist and he's talking about how, in many cases, sort of having too many choices actually makes us. Yeah. worse choosers. <laughs> and I don't think that that says anything particular about free will or not. But I do think that these ideas, uh, I do think that the book nicely shows just how uh, robust the various options that we have in our lives are, and how sometimes maybe having fewer of them would uh, make our lives simpler, and if not make us better choosers and better agents. And every few years you get something new, like uh, just the last few years it's gluten-free or having gluten or whatnot. Um, uh, well, let me let me just step back too, because I had mentioned in the conversation with Mealy about the idea of mind. Because in order to, I mean, you did mention that some people think electrons or positrons or quarks even might have some kind of free will, which seems to me a little bit silly. But uh, it seems to me that one of the requisites that most people would uh, have to grant for free will is that we are conscious beings; that there is a mind. Hence. It would seem to me that consciousness or what defines the mind is integral to how we view free will. Someone like Daniel Dennett believes that the mind is just sort of uh, 
an epiphenomenon of the, the overwhelm of information that the brain has to process. Other people probably still believe in the little homunculus that's in the back of our heads, and other people have other ideas. Um, do you what what idea or uh, conception of the mind, the human mind, or any kind of uh, consciousness do you think is needed to have these ideas of free will to be able to to make them work? Uh, that's a good question, and, and probably one that I don't have a, a fully worked out answer on. Uh, the last couple of years, I've been uh, more inclined to the idea that agency in general comes in degrees. Mm -hmm. And so it's not as if something's an agent or something's not an agent. Mm -hmm. I think that developmental psychology, I think that the robustness uh, and, and the variety we find in the animal kingdom, uh, I think even that some of the work I've been doing uh, lately on disability shows us that agency in general is going to be a graded process. You could be a not just a better or worse agent, but you could have a higher degree of agency, a, a more robust um, agency. And I'm building off that in part, I'm inclined to think that free will is also going to come in degrees. Mm -hmm. And so it might be uh, difficult to say exactly what degree of mental states, what degree of consciousness is going to be needed uh, um, in order for us to be free agents in particular, in part because if uh, freedom is this graded concept, then the degree of consciousness, the degree of uh, uh, various kinds of mental states, beliefs, desires, uh, so on and so forth, that we would need to be free is itself going to be a graded concept or uh, a sort of a graded um, uh, bar. And so it might not be the kind of uh, thing that we can provide a precise answer to you simply because right, uh, consciousness itself might be a degree concept. Well, do you think that free will is something that might fall under the realm of what is called qualia, i.e., that we can never determine? I could never determine, for example, whether you are a, a, an individual with consciousness and free will, or are you just uh, something reacting to stimulus, a, a philosophical zombie? Do you think that those ideas are kind of intertwined? Yeah, they probably are. I mean, I'm inclined to think that I might be able to know enough about uh, a particular person in a particular situation uh, to think that in those cases, in that in that situation, that the person doesn't satisfy uh, the con conditions needed for freedom. I think that I can look at, for example, my, my cup here and say, yeah, given what I know about the nature of the cup, I have no evidence to think that it is a free agent and lots of evidence to think that it's not. I think that pointing to cases where uh, we, we are inclined to think that people do have uh, free agency is the kind of thing that we always have to be sort of cautious about. Um, uh, I think that we can uh, sort of look at the evidence and say, given the best evidence that we have, I think it's likely, probable, um, but always defeasible that a particular agent in a particular condition is going, and in a particular situation is going to have freedom. Um, but that, in part, follows from my more general fallibilism about most things philosophical. Um, let me talk about uh, something that probably is at the heart of uh, the debate about free will, and that's ideas of compatibilism, i.e. that you could perhaps have uh, uh, free will, but in a deterministic universe, i.e. that things are inevitably just sort of statistically going to go one way, but we can choose to go another way. Uh, there are degrees of compatibilism. Um, some people believe in a thing called the block universe, that everything exists, that time is an illusion, and that we're just sort of going through the motions and we're just ignorant of what our fate is to be. Are you a compatibilist? What is your position, pro or con on compatibilism? Uh, I'm an incompatibilist, and so I think that there are some good, but not decisive. I think that decisive arguments in philosophy are, are pretty hard to come by. But I think that there are good arguments that lead me to believe that if we were causally determined, or even if we were theologically determined, then we wouldn't have the kind of control needed uh, for freedom. I think that one of these arguments is going to be a version of what uh, Peter Van Inwagen has popularized as the consequence argument. Uh, the consequence argument comes in a, a, a number of varieties, but it basically holds that uh, suppose we don't have any control over one particular thing, and say we don't have control over that if that thing uh, 
uh, is the case, then this other thing is the case. Then it's hard to see how we have control over the second thing. Mm -hmm. And so if causal determinism is true, then everything we do is a function of uh, the non-relational past and the laws of nature. Uh, it's just the way that uh, 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 the truth of causal determinism is usually understood. If I don't have control over the non-relational past and the laws of nature, and if the past and the laws are a certain way, then I have to do this uh, particular action, then it's hard to see how I control my action uh, uh, in the way that I think would be needed um, for freedom and responsibility. I think so. I think that uh, a version of that argument, which uh, the exact details of it get complex pretty quick, but I think that some version of the consequence argument is going to show us that uh, acting freely is incompatible with the truth of causal determinism. I think you can run a parallel kind of argument for the truth of theological determinism as well. And in uh, one of the books, uh, Free Will, Sourcehood, and its uh, alternatives. I not only look at that argument, but I, I uh, use a version of um, uh, a slightly different argument that suggests that if we have free will, then the source of action, sort of the origination of an action for us to be free, has to come uh, from within us in a way that's not determined by something outside of us. And again, I think that's going to give us incompatibilism as a conclusion. Yeah, I've always yeah. found it kind of puzzling uh, when we talk about compatibilism. I think a lot of people, and I come from the arts, and I, I like uh, the idea that words have particular meanings. And when it's, it's similar to the argument about, you know, if God is omnipotent, uh, well, that brings up certain logical uh, problems. And if, if we're talking about something uh, not having free will, it seems to me that I can't. I, I don't think that there can be degrees of free will. It's sort of like being pregnant. You either are or you're not. You can't be ninety eight percent have ninety eight percent free will. You, you know what I'm saying? I think. Do, do you see that sort of uh, uh, degree argument as as also being a flaw in compatibilism? Um, I don't see how that would be a flaw in compatibilism. I mean, as far as I can tell, whether or not freedom uh, is degreed or a binary uh, concept and whether or not determinism is compatible with, with freedom are, are uh, orthogonal to each other. I don't see how an answer to one of those entails an answer to the other question. Yeah. Um, let me just talk a moment about conceptions of uh, a, a creator and infinite regress, because to me it would seem that if one were to argue that we do not have free will, we'd have to accept that the universe is then far more infinitely complex because it's going to know every outcome that could possibly happen in every quantum situation up to the, the end of the cosmos itself, if there is such a thing. And that would imply that some creature, some creator, some being, some god-like thing would have to have set this all in motion, which means that that thing would have to have had free will Otherwise, there's have to be a creator for that creator, and we get that sort of, you know, the old thing about elephants standing on elephants or turtles standing on turtles going all the way down. Um, do, you, do you find that there's a, a, a logical problem with that kind of infinite regress if we, if we were to get rid of free will? Um, not one that's obvious to me. I mean, I think that there are uh, related... Uh, infinite regress problems. So I think that one of the arguments for the existence of God, uh, which is uh, sometimes called the contingency-based cosmological argument, I think is a, is, is a pretty good argument. Again, I, I'm inclined to think that there aren't any, or at least there are very few, obviously decisive arguments in philosophy. But the contingency-based argu uh, cosmological argument roughly says, consider any contingent being, something that does exist but doesn't have to exist. Well, if it doesn't have to exist, then we need some kind of explanation for why it does exist rather than not exist, right? So if you say that my contingent existence is explained for by, by my parents, and then, but my parents are contingent, you want to know what explains their existence, yeah. and you can keep going back and back. And even if the, the uh, universe were infinitely old, now, I think that we have evidence to probably think that it's not. But even if it were, you might wonder what explains why there is this infinite set of contingent beings 
at all. Mm -hmm. And so the contingency-based cosmological argument says, even if you have an infinite series of contingent things, and each member in that series is the explanation for the existence of the other, you still need an explanation for the infinite set as a whole. And so we get an argument uh, for the existence of a non-contingent or necessary being. So I think that something like that's a pretty good argument for, right, sort of like the first step towards theism. Yeah. Um, but it's not clear to me how an argument uh, for the existence of freedom is going to follow a parallel track. Mm. Um, again, in part because I've suggested that freedom comes in degrees. Yeah. Um, and so I think that, um, uh, that we have reason to think that it might be a free thing that through the right kind of developmental process could come from an unfree thing. Mm. So take a child when they're first born. I take it that two-year-olds don't have freedom. They might have agency in a certain kind of way. But if, like me, you think that free will is the kind of control needed for moral responsibility, I don't think a two-year-old uh, has free will. But presumably, by the time they're 25, 26, um, exactly where we draw the line is going to be largely an issue of developmental psychology. But I think that most adult humans are free agents, at least some of the time. And so you're going to have to tell a developmental story of how a non-free and responsible entity can, can develop into through uh, interaction with its environment, through further complication of its mental life, uh, can become a free and responsible agent. And if you can tell that kind of story, my guess is you can tell a fairly similar uh, evolutionary story about how free and responsible agents evolved from free and responsible agents. So it's not clear to me that if we are free and responsible, then it has to be um, that there are free and responsible agents all the way back in the causal story, so to speak. Well... When we talk about God, usually here in the West, we're talking about the Abrahamic idea of a God, uh, an all-knowing, all-powerful being. Uh, other religions have what we would, I guess, consider lesser gods versus the Abrahamic tradition. But uh, would not free will in and of itself be a perfect refutation, an obviation of the Abrahamic type of God? Because if we do have free will and no one... To, to have free will, you can't know what I'm going to do five seconds, much less five minutes from now, and neither could that divine being. Well, then out the window goes uh, omniscience. Uh, so uh, we we couldn't have we. You can't be a believer, for example, uh, in free will, and then be, believe in God if you really truly believe in free will. At least the Abrahamic version of a God. Yeah, I mean, if it were the case that. Um uh, God had to be omniscient, uh, and if it were the case that we had free will, and if it were the case that uh, an omniscient being uh, entailed that we didn't have free will, right? Then we we we'd have a problem there. Uh -huh. um, but uh, I don't think that there's a threat from omniscience towards uh, free will, uh -huh. and so there's at least one step in the argument for the denial of God from the existence of our free will that I think uh, isn't a good step. Um, in my earlier conversation with uh, Mealy, uh, I had talked about uh, possible substitutions for a godlike figure in, in, in the proponents of uh, non-free will, and being that if one were to argue that we lived in a perfectly sane and rational cosmos, and if I want to claim to be a, a perfectly sane and rational being, I can only act in a perfectly sane and rational way. Henceforth, just definitionally, then, someone would say that I'm not predetermined. It's not determinism that makes me that a sane and rational being. That's just the nature of what I am. And for me to claim that, I have to act that way simply to fit in with what we consider the definition of those properties. Um, do you find those kinds of arguments convincing in any way? Um, I mean, I think that's actually a really important issue, and it's one that I've looked at in some of my work in uh, on free will in the philosophy of religion. And so I think that a lot depends on how a person gets the kind of character, what I call moral character, this idea of perfectly rational agency, as you referred to it, um, where that comes from. So I think that if God, for instance, were to... Uh, uh, 
zap me or do whatever it is that God does and make it so that I have a perfect understanding of what the right thing to do is in every situation. And also in his zapping me makes it so that I have to, with some sort of necessity, act on what I uh, rightly understand to be the right thing to do in every situation. Then it looks like uh, that I've got my moral character from outside of myself, right? God has given me the kind of perfected, rational, and volitional, and intellectual faculties that govern the exercise of my agency. But insofar as earlier I thought, right, endorsed a version of the, of the um, uh, consequence argument, then I think you could run a version of the consequence argument right there. Um, but I think that humans, for instance, probably don't have their uh, um, moral uh, character uh, developed in that sort of way, right? If if God, uh, through theological determinism, guaranteed the kind of moral character that I did, that either guaranteed me to do sinful actions, really bad actions, or guaranteed that I do uh, uh, perfect actions, morally good actions, then I think that I actually wouldn't be morally uh, blameworthy in the first case, morally praiseworthy in the second case, and, and, and thus not morally responsible. But if instead we have a, a play a developmental role in us coming to have that kind of nature, then um, uh, the idea is that what guarantees us to act in a certain way isn't something outside of us, but a freely formed and developed character on our own. So I've, I've, I've looked at this in a series of articles with my uh, uh, friend and co-author, Tim Paul, who teaches at the University of uh, St. Thomas up in the Twin Cities. And we're looking at what a number of other philosophers of religion have called the paradox of heaven. And so the idea here is, and, and we're primarily looking at within Christian theology that you could probably develop a similar kind of, of puzzle about uh, um, other Abrahamic traditions, at least, if not other traditions even more broadly. But if we take that um, the redeemed in heaven are free, and if we take, as at least as Christian theology has tended to say, that those who are in uh, uh, the redeemed in heaven can't sin again, it looks like we've got free agents who can't do morally bad actions. Hmm. But if free agents can't do morally bad actions, you wonder why God didn't just create us like that to begin with and avoid the fall and all the, the, the sort of, um, uh, you know, the, the problem of evil kinds of concerns that we have here in the world. Yeah. And what Tim and I argue is that if God just gave us that moral character, um, uh, without our participation in developing it, then we wouldn't be free. But we think that in order to freely form the kind of character that rules out certain choices, we have to have a free uh, participation in us forming that character. And so we draw on a broadly Aristotelian view of character formation and suggest that God just can't zap us into perfection uh, if we're still to be free. But God can cooperate with us such that over time, all morally bad choices are the kind that we see no good reason to perform. And if we can only freely perform an action that we think there is reason, uh, we see some kind of good in, then if we've got um, no good, if we see no good reason in, in doing a sinful action over a good action, then we're not going to be able to do that anymore. But what's going to necessitate us in that case isn't the past and the laws of nature as a causal determinism. It's not going to be God's overriding volition that uh, uh, entails everything that happens in the case of theological determinism, but it's a, it's a necessity of our own freely developed character. And that's the kind of necessity that I think is compatible with our acting freely. Uh, your whole uh, digression there was what someone could term supernaturalism. And I'm wondering if here in the 21st century, that part of the, the reaction against the idea of free will is that it seems to me to be intimately wrapped up with Darwinian notions of evolution and and the, the blind watchmaker kind of uh, idea. Uh, uh, do you think that, in a sense, that people who argue against free will are basically closet supernaturalists, whereas people who are free will advocates tend to be naturalists or materialists? 
Uh, it's not clear to me that the evidence supports that. Um, I know a number of free will deniers who are uh, devout religious believers. Um, I know a number of free will deniers who are going to be naturalists and oppose any kind of supernatural explanation for any part of the universe. Then what? Then what? Then what are the? What are those that uh, that are uh, the naturalists? What mechanism other than a supernatural being do they say could? could have possibly taken away or never granted agency to you or me or anyone else in the, the first place? Well, I think that they're not going to say anybody took it away. It's mm. just the kind of thing that, that uh, we lack. And so an example here is going to be Neil Levy. Um, as far as I know, Neil's a, a naturalist. He doesn't believe in any kind of right, uh, deity, supernatural um, uh, being, God. But... But Levy thinks that the, uh, luck is the kind of thing that probably means that we don't have free will, whether or not compatibilism or incompatibilism is true. And so he thinks that in order for us to be free, we'd have to have a certain kind of control over our actions that luck would undermine. But he thinks that we have really good reason to think that that kind of luck uh, uh, obtains in the world or undermines our freedom. So it's not that he thinks that we had free will, and then a non-supernatural beat somehow took it away. It's just the kind of thing that we lack, um, much as, um, uh, at least in some ways, this comparison might be apt. In other ways, it's going to be problematic. But, but humans don't have the power to fly and eat it. It's not as if a supernatural being came in and took away the power for us to fly on it. It's just the kind of thing that we never had to begin with. And I think that on some folks' picture, that's how free will is. It's the kind of thing that just never arose for various kinds of reasons in the naturalistic evolutionary story that they think explains the cosmos. But that would then necess necessarily say that that person is advocating that we are basically zombies, that we don't, if we don't have free will, we don't have any itness, uh, selfness. We are not individuals then because if, I mean, I can't flap my wings and fly because that's a physical impossibility against uh, uh, against gravity. I, I don't have enough lift. I don't have feathers. I don't have light enough bones. I'm not, I'm too large at 180 or so pounds. Uh, that's a fundamentally different thing though than talking about the four or five pounds of brain inside our craniums and not being able to do something. I mean, to me, that's, that seems a, a yeah, different... And again, that's where the, the analogy is going to break down. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I mean, that's a function of all analogies. Yeah. Uh, but it's not clear to me why, simply because we lacked free will, we'd be zombies in the mm. sense, at least the philosophical sense of zombies, as opposed to the pop culture sense yeah. of zombies, is taken to be sort of a, a, a creature that behaves and looks like us but has... Uh, uh, right, doesn't have beliefs or desires or certain kind of mental states. Mm -hmm. It's not. I don't see why the fact that we don't have free will would mean that we don't really have beliefs or desires. Mm -hmm. It would just mean that if we have beliefs and desires, that they don't play a certain kind of role in explaining why we do have free will. Um, let me just ask this a question I asked Mealy as well. Um, a lot of people would uh, suggest that the opposite of the idea of having free will means that there has to pre be predestination. And I, I've wondered uh, if the opposite of free will, getting back to what you might have earlier said about the, the overwhelm of choices, is sheer randomness. Is Do you, do you think that uh, perhaps that the, the plethora of things that could possibly happen in, in a day, and within, within reason, not just the pink elephant appearing in the room behind you, but the, the plethora of things that could happen in a day uh, it's just so overwhelming that uh, it gets back, I guess, to the argument of we go for the most natural choice to make if we consider ourselves a rational being. Uh, so what I'm, I guess, arguing or, or asking is, do you think that uh, predestiny or randomness are really the opposite of what we would consider uh, free will, free choice? Yeah, it, it, it's not clear to me that either randomness or free will, or sorry, uh, either randomness or predestination are the denial of free will. I mean, I take it the, 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 the denial of free will is just the claim that we lack free will. And it might be that we lack free will uh, for reasons other than randomness. It might be, I mean, I think that Levy's concerns about how certain kinds of luck would undermine free will are actually really important and, and uh, uh, really 
really interesting. But it could be that everything, again, uh, it's metaphysically possible that everything is causally determined. So there is no luck, there is no randomness, and yet we lack free will, especially if incompatibilism is true. Uh, but it could be, I mean, right, so we could have no free will, but not because of luck. So the two aren't going to be opposites. Um, I think also something, uh, just because you think that we lack, or just because a person thinks that we lack free will, doesn't necessitate that they believe in some kind of predestination. Mm -hmm. And also, I think that the fact that somebody believes in certain forms of predestination doesn't entail that they believe that uh, there is no free will. So the um, idea, so just to give an analogy so people can more comprehend that, um, uh, someone who would say we don't have free will but there's no predestination is basically arguing that basically we exist sort of as spume on a big tide that is carrying us someplace and it may it may hit against the rocks it may wash up on a beach it may go into a cove we don't know where but it, it it's not predestined it's not predestined we just don't have any control of where we're going to wash up yeah yeah i mean i take it that if some kind of naturalistic picture were true uh, then there's not a being that is, in fact, doing the predestining. Well, I mean, I guess you could have a non-divine being, right, that was predestining us if we were just part of a, uh, a computer simulation or something like that. But, but uh, just because you think that we don't have free will doesn't, I, as far as I can tell, entail that you think that there is a being that is in fact controlling every aspect of our lives and, and that's one way that the idea of predestination is often understood is is the idea of say statistical likelihood of an event is that often a way out for people who uh don't believe in free will i.e that um it's statistically likely that if let's say uh i grew up uh in an Italian neighborhood that I'm going to like Italian girls rather than Chinese girls. Uh, and uh, so it's statistically likely that I might marry an Italian girl than a Chinese girl, uh, but that isn't predestination. Uh, but it's just, it's just the overwhelm of, of the events that have defined that existence. Um, is there such a thing as, I guess, not statistical determinism, but st statistical likelihood of events uh, taking away or somehow obviating or negating an idea yeah. of free will? Yeah, I think so. Um, uh, so I grew up in a small town in Ohio, and for most of my growing up, we didn't have um, a lot of ethnic food choices uh, uh, in town. There, and I, c I could go and I could get Italian food, but there, there wasn't any ethnic Chinese food, say, in town, mm -hmm. right? Um, there wasn't a Thai restaurant, there wasn't a sushi restaurant. And so the likelihood that I would come to really like any of those, right, uh, while I was confined to small town, Mount Vernon, Ohio, is, is pretty small. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I got older and I ventured more outside the town I grew up in that, that I uh, then went to a Chinese restaurant, that I would later then come to have Thai food, you know, try sushi, this kind of stuff. And so certainly the kinds of opportunities and um, uh, experiences we have in life can in fact uh, uh, put constraints on the kinds of choices that we make. And so, right, there are going to be certain things that make it more likely that we make certain choices. There are going to be uh, facts about our histories that make us less likely to make other choices. Um, I think that's true. And so I think that we can explain, you know, part of why some options uh, don't seem to be particularly uh, salient to individuals because of these kind of statistical notions that you're asking about. Uh, there seems to be uh, in modern culture, not just in science, not just in philosophy, but uh, a very loose sling ar slinging around of words uh, and not really hewing to what their definitions are. A couple of examples I could give in science or philosophy, um, uh, the most famous one probably Schrodinger's cat, wherein that whole experiment about whether the cat is alive or dead was not used as a proof by Schrodinger. It was actually used as 
his way of mocking the idea that a being could be in two separate states, or at least a, a, a large being like a cat rather than a quantum thing like a quark being in two states of superposition. And that's that's been totally bollocks uh, uh, in popular culture. Another example that I would give is that uh, when we think of like the double slit experiment, and people think that there's a multiverse is... Uh, uh, what that really means is that's not proof of a multiverse. That's proof that there could there's a potential thing there. And a potential thing is not a real thing. For example, uh, while uh, a quark may pop into existence uh, randomly over X millions or tr billions of years, uh, that proverbial pink elephant that I mentioned is not going to just suddenly pop in behind you because that would take an almost infinite uh, array of of interconnections between random events is simply not going to happen. So do you think that when we talk about free will that a lot of the problems between people isn't the incompatibilism of of the ideas themselves but the incompatibility of some of the words and the ideas yeah. and the context that we use on up in different camps? Yeah, I think that's certainly the case. Um, I mean, I think that our culture is just full of all sorts of ideas, the scientific ones you mentioned, philosophical ideas like free will, where people aren't particularly careful about how they're understanding terms. They uh, use them in ways that are often unreflective, and other people uh, be using them in slightly different ways. And so if you have people not paying attention to how their terms are getting used, and then they're having this argument, right? You can see how we could have some strange claims. So individuals that think um, all, uh, earlier I mentioned how some people seem to suggest that all, uh, uh, not only humans, but even down to the level of electrons and quarks have free will. Mm -hmm. So far as I can tell, what they mean by that is uh, free will as they're using it is just the denial of determinism. Mm -hmm. So they're just saying there's a certain bit of indeterministic behavior that that particle, that entity might follow. Mm -hmm. If that's what you mean by free will, then I'm happy, you know, given what I know about the current leading views in, in uh, quantum mechanics, to say that it, right, a quark has that kind of indeterminacy. But it's a long step from there to, to say that quarks have free will yeah. in the way that we typically mean free will to be used. Um, I think some of the debates in the last 10 years in our culture about the nature of marriage show the same kind of indeterminacy, um, where some people are taking marriage to be primarily a um, political kind of relationship. Other people are taking it to be a sacramental or religious uh, 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 relationship, where for much of human history, those two notions haven't gone together for maybe the past uh, uh, four or 500 years, they largely have, right? Um, and so I think that not only in our debates about free will, other debates in philosophy, debates about science, I think that we could all have a lot of confusion if we were really careful on what exactly we meant by these terms. Yeah, I, I myself have never found the, the argument about uh, basic particles having some kind of consciousness i.e. then free will, because I think they go hand in hand, uh, to be particularly convincing, because uh, it's sort of like I've, I've done, I actually did a trilogy of shows on consciousness, and one of the fellows I interviewed said that some people believe that consciousness is not created within the mind or the, or the, the brain, the physical brain, but is somehow we're sort of picking up consciousness from the ether, which seems to me, well, what the hell kind of a thing could be broadcasting consciousness, and how uh, how can it be that that you're always tuned into the Kevin Timpy channel and I'm tuned into the Dan Sh Schneider channel? Why aren't we sometimes mixed up? Why uh, why am I not sometimes Gina Lola Brigida? It, it to me never makes sense. Yeah, and I think that when I you know looked at those articles that claim that even the the microscopic particles have free will. Uh, Either I'm left just completely baffled by what they mean by the term free will, yeah. or I realize that what they mean by free will is something other than I think the debates about free will and philosophy are really getting at. So yeah, I, I share your puzzlement. Now, I, I, I guess the, to just to take the, the opposite view, to, to, to play devil's advocate, I guess someone might turn around the evolutionary argument and say that, well, our ancestors, when they were hungry, when their sensory perceptions uh, got prey, 
within their senses that they see the little thing crawling or they smell a flower that smells sweet, uh, they have this, oh, must devour, must devour, whatever it is that compels them to do that simple, almost binary kind of reaction, and that these things have just complexified and we're just simply not aware that we are just still following these basic impulses. We have through maybe the Dennett-like idea of the illusion that the mind exists. I think that's the essence of the mind, not the illusion, but if we go with Dennett, he thinks that's an illusion of the mind, that the argument would be that we're simply following these road processes, but think we aren't. Uh, so uh, would, would that argument, I guess, I guess uh, people against free will would argue that uh, people who believe in free will are somehow self-delusive in that sense. Yeah, I mean, I think that whether or not we are self-delusive in that sense depends on whether or not, for instance, there really is free will. I think that's a hard question uh, uh, answer at certain times. Um, I mean, it's often very difficult to prove that we're not subject to these, you know, certain kinds of hidden variables or features that we're just not aware of. Um, I mean, I think I came, you know, came to my office today in order uh, to have a fun, interesting, hope, hopefully um, other people find it so too, conversation, right? Now, imagine somebody saying, well, but Kevin, how do you know that you're really just not deluded that that's why you were doing it? You were just trying to get away from an afternoon with your family, or you got this sort of unconscious request that you're going to make of Dan in the future, and if you do him a favor, he's more likely to do you a favor. How do you know that you're not just deluded to think that uh, uh, one of these, you know, uh, self um deceived that one of these other explanations is really the case. Yeah. Um, well, right, again, I don't know that I can be certain that I'm not self-deceived in this case, but I think that you know we don't have any good reason to think that I am, uh, uh, am in fact, self-deceived in that kind of way. Yeah. Um, similar about free will. It's not clear to me that we have sufficient evidence to think that we are, in fact, just the that all of our behaviors is just the outputs of our beliefs, desires, in a way that's necessitated by the various kinds of sensory inputs that you're talking about. Yeah, it, it's if, uh, you know, am I certain that it's not? Yeah. No, but again, I'm not certain about lots of things in my life. Uh, I think that the best evidence suggests that humans probably have free will. Um, but I think that, again, for all I know, it's epistemically possible that I'm wrong, and, and it turns out that we, that we lack it. Yeah, I was just going to go uh, there myself and say that it reminds me of the old brain in the pan argument about consciousness or, or the matrix argument, if you want to get more modern, and that, you know, how can we prove that we're just not imagining all this, each and every one of us is a, a little brain floating in a vat or a pan or something, but it's, it would seem to me that the burden of proof seems to fall on those who would deny it because for all I know, if I flex my five fingers, I can feel each of my fingers with my thumb and it can feel the thumb. I can feel the tip of my nose. I can go and talk to my wife. She seems to be there. I can email you. I can talk, talk to you. These things seem to be real. It seem, seems that they, they, these are evolved functions that have helped me and all of my ancestors back since the dawn of life on earth evolve to, to at least live long enough to reproduce. These things all seem real. So it seems to me the burden is not on those who would claim to have free will. It ha would have to be on the deniers. Would you agree with that? Uh, what you're suggesting is is a position in epistemology. I'm no epistemologist, uh, but, but it's called phenomenal conservatism. And that the basic idea is that uh, the default ought to be what seems to be what, what would you know what, what, what would preserve the uh, um, appearances to ourselves. Yeah. And so you're right that the appearance looks to be that I'm here, not that I'm a brain in a vat, not that um, right, it looks to be like my behavior is not just the outputs of my beliefs, desires. Yeah. And so I think that in terms of a burden of proof, the default ought to be um, right the way that things initially appear to us. Now, there are times when I think that that initial appearance, right, is overridden by good evidence, um, you know, right? I think that, like, when I, when I look at my, my coffee or my water cup here, or my hat or something, and when I think about sort of what the initial uh, common sense view about solidity is, yeah. right, what it means to be a solid, well, I think that physics gives us a good reason to think that that, that common sense view about solidity is wrong. 
right? Uh, atoms are 99.976, right, percent empty space or something like that. And solidity really isn't a thing exhausting the space, but it's the, it's uh, the electrical atoms fields. not being able to interpenetrate each other because of magnetic repulsion or right. something like that. Yeah. So I do think that in certain cases, we have good reasons to re revive or sorry, not to revive, to revise the common sense appearances to us. Um, but I do think that the way things seem to uh, seem to us to be is right probably the best starting point for reflecting on these kinds of things. Well, I want to end the, the show giving you a closing remark and just talk about any, uh, maybe what you're working on in the future. But before we do that, let me just end with this question, since, since uh, I believe the scientific method uh, is probably the greatest invention that mankind has. Sometimes I've argued with some physicists who I, who seem to think that the scientific method doesn't apply to some of their things. But other than that, um, what would it take for, for you evidentially to say, my God, you're right, we don't have free will. What would falsify your belief in free will? Uh, well, given that I'm a com uh, committed incompatibilist, right, and and I am in print as being a libertarian of the metaphysical sort, not the political sort, a yeah. uh, libertarian is just an incompatibilist who thinks that we do have free will. Um, and so if I could be convinced either of the truth of causal determinism or of theological determinism, or if I were to reread uh, Neil Lundy's Hard Luck, and I think that luck does in fact undermine our, our freedom, uh, there are at least three ways that I could come to be uh, right, deny that we have free will. Um, so given my incompatibilism, I think that certain kinds of things have to either obtain or not obtain for us to, to be free. And if I became convinced that those conditions that needed to obtain didn't, or those uh, um, conditions that needed to not obtain did obtain, then the rational thing for me to do would be to right stop believing the existence of free will. And I think I would do that. Um, but again, right going back to the. Uh, and can you just enumerate part, those three things briefly? Could you enumerate right, those uh, three things briefly? Yeah. Either if I became convinced of the truth of causal determinism. If I became convinced of the truth of theological determinism, or if I became convinced that uh, all of us are subject to freedom undermining luck or randomness in a way that undermines freedom rather than contributes to it, I could see me giving up my belief that we do have free will. Uh, okay, yeah. But I, what I was trying to get to is, would that, would that giving up be, let's say if we found out that an asteroid was hurtling towards the earth and you had a vision of a burning bush and God said, Kevin, it's up to you. If you believe in me, I will swerve the asteroid. You say, okay, God, I believe in you. And the asteroid misses the earth. Would, I mean, are we talking about some major kind of thing like that as, as proof? Uh, a proof that we have free will? Well, yeah, if, if, let's, if let's say, I, I, I gave a, a sort of an outrageous example, but I just wanted to, you enumerated the three things, but get, like, give me just one thing that would turn you, you know, to, to say that if you had proof, what would be one of those examples of proof of saying? Okay. Um, I mean, um, maybe I, I talk to a bunch of physicists and I say, hey, tell me whether or not you think causal determinism is true. And if 99 out of 100 of the world's best physicists told me, we've got really good reason to think that causal determinism is true, then that would give me a lot of evidence to think that we're not free and responsible. Okay. Um, a number of years ago, I was at a, a conference between philosophers and physicists in China, and there, uh, I had the opportunity to ask a Nobel-winning physicist um, of the top 100 physicists, how many of them do you think believe that causal determinism is true of the sort that philosophers are concerned about in these debates? And I explained him what he meant. Or what, what causal determinism meant, and he kind of laughed, and he said, probably none. <laughs> so, you know, that gives me good reason to think that if none of the world's leading physicists think that causal determinism is true, and that doesn't mean that it's not, right? Scientists have been wrong in the past, they're likely to be wrong in, in the present and the future, but that gives me lots of evidence to think that causal determinism isn't in fact true. Okay, well, uh, let me then just ask, because uh, you've written a couple of books on free will, uh, is this a subject that is going to interest you in the future, or do you see yourself sort of mooted out, and uh, what is the next focus uh, of your career? 
Yeah, I mean, the, the questions about free will still really interest me. But in the past five years or six years or so, I've put out two books on the, sort of the philosophical questions about free will. I've written a book on how free will sort of shapes certain debates in, in theology. I've edited uh, a 750-page Rutledge Companion to Free Will with Neil Levy and, and Megan Griffith. Um, it's not clear to me that I've got a whole lot else to say about free will right now. Um, and so it'll stay in interest, but it's, it's not the sort of central focus of my research right now. Okay. About two years ago, I got really interested in issues in philosophy of disability. And so right now, I'm tentatively working on two books, sort of on the nature of disability and on how disability affects agency in general. Mm -hmm. And those are both pretty early on in the stages. One's supposed to be an academic text uh, of the sort that I've written in the past. The other is just sort of a, a general public book what I wish, you know, the average person on the street knew about disability that I didn't know until a couple of years ago. And so those are probably going to take me at least two or three years to, to finish up. And so that's going to be a lot more my focus going forward than write, writing more stuff on free will for a while. Well, my final question, I guess, is just a brief one. Uh, do you think that in your lifetime that the quest for artificial intelligence is the thing that may have the most bearing on future perceptions of free will? If we can sort of get consciousness in seemingly non-organic material, uh, that should have repercussions on free will, don't you think? Oh, I certainly think it would have re re repercussions. I, it it's not clear to me that that would solve all the philosophical debates, yeah. right? I don't see how the existence of AI would entail that compatibilism were true. I don't see how the existence of AI would entail that incompatibilism were true. Yeah. But it's certainly the kind of question that I think you're right would have a profound effect on us as humans in lots and lots of ways, including how we think about the nature of free will. Okay, well, kevintimpy.com is your personal website. I'll link to that as well as your academic website. So I want to thank you for spending about an hour talking about free will with me. Yeah, thank you.